morning, everyone. Uh, well, this is it. Moth Caves exists, and most of the team is gathered here. Um, before I begin, I'd like uh, to pay a tribute to our uh, hosts today, uh, without which none of this would have been possible. Uh, they made a wonderful job in organizing the coming three days. So I'd like you please to join me in a warm applause to Christina Pellini and Silvia Borca. Um, I'll start with uh, a short overview of the project. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize on behalf of uh, our project leader, Luis Amoreto, which unfortunately could not join uh, today for, for the kickoff event. She's stuck in Brussels. Uh, and I am replacing her in this occasion. So, uh, what will I talk about? First, a few words on the funding scheme that is actually has granted us uh, this award to run the project. Uh, then a few words on the Mothscapes people, because we're first of all a large and exciting group of people. Uh, a research topic, obviously. Our research question, questions. Uh, and a few elements of methodology, beginning with the main concepts that uh, are kind of underlying the whole project, uh, the case studies that we're dealing with, the work packages, this very bureaucratic uh, wording, um, and our objectives, and then briefly an overview of our work plan and uh, expected outputs. So supposedly after that, you, all of you will be multi-case experts. All right, so uh, the funding scheme, uh, Mouthscape is being funded under uh, HERA uh, award. HERA is a network of national and sometimes regional research councils, research agencies. It exists since 2005 uh, with the aim of supporting and funding humanities-based research projects. It's the only scheme at the European level that is specifically focused on research in the humanities. Um, and it does quite a lot of lobbying at the European level uh, to open up research and funding opportunities for people and projects in the humanities. It's basically a co-funded scheme. So that means that the research agencies are putting up some money, and this money is being topped up by the European Commission. There has been, until now, three calls. The first call was uh, launched in 2009. It dealt with two main themes, cultural dynamics, inheritance and identity, and humanities as a source of creativity and innovation. Uh, you see a few figures there uh, that will show you that from one call to the other, there's been an increasing number of participating countries and research councils as a whole, uh, and an increase in funding, um, but also an increase in applications. So we're uh, happy enough to be funded under the third uh, HERA call, uh, whose topic is users of the past. So just let me say a few words uh, about the general team, the general focus of this call. Um, the questions that the applicants were requested to answer uh, were ranging from the following. How and by whom European, non-European or global parts are actively and instrumentally used to what ends they are used in connection to past or present debates or transformations in Europe, what drives historical understanding in the arts, film, literature, public space, landscapes, and so on, 
let me tell you that the word landscape did not appear in the original code. So it appeared after we were selected, invited to present our project in the second phase. So landscape was not considered uh, a discipline of the humanities in the eyes of Hera. That's one achievement of which Derek from Cityscape would be very happy, I guess. Um, how our cultural diversity has been formed and how it may be shaped and directed in the future. Now, there are a number of focus areas um, on which the applicants were invited to submit to orient their proposals on changing uses of the past, different paths, uses of the past for identity construction, or and institutional embedding of norms and values, um, uses of the past in media, in material culture, in public space, uses of the past at the national, international, or regional dimensions, um, uses of the past and their impact on solving current problems, decision making, and future policies. So, I want to believe that our project kind of responds to all of these themes and most of these focus areas. Uh, we'll see if we've been a bit too ambitious and can actually achieve uh, to answer these questions. Mondscape's people. So, this is the core team, basically. Um, we have, starting from the left, Dirk Gotsman from Cyberscape, please raise your hand. And Simon Bell from Estonia, Christina Pallini, whom you've met already, uh, Luisa from Brussels, who couldn't be here, uh, myself, Maria Elena Maya from Porto, thank you, and Victoria Caprizi from Berlin. Obviously, the team has grown in numbers and importance. Um, it's basically organized with a number of research partners. So, and each research partner is represented by a principal investigator and his team. So, in Brussels, uh, under the supervision of Luis Amoretto, uh, we have myself and Michele. Christina has uh, also uh, an interesting and large team. All of these question marks are people to be hired at a certain point and join the team when the calls will be launched. Um, Victoria from Berlin, Irina Maya from Porto with her football team, <laughs> uh, Simon and the uh, nice people from Estonia. Then we have associated partners. These are people, institutions from civil society, uh, organizations that are not uh, basically fundamentally uh, into research, but they are basically are linked to the real people out there. You know? um, so we have four of them. One is kind of missing. Um, we have Dr. Bongo, represented by Anna Kostoyish, uh, Civilscape by Dr. Gossman, uh, Eccles by Simon and uh, uh, his colleague Ellen Fetzer from Munich, uh, and an exhibition partner which we're still uh, chasing, uh, and that will be our assignment on Wednesday. Uh, and then there's an advisory board, the Council of the Wise People. Um, Hans Palan, which should be arriving from one moment to another. Thomas Oyen, please, Thomas, raise your hand so everyone sees you. Uh, Miles Glendening, back there, and uh, Jacques Pellet, who could not be with us uh, today. So what about the research topic? Um, Mothscapes deals with new rural landscapes produced by large-scale agricultural development and colonization schemes implemented in the 20th century throughout Europe and beyond. We're looking at these new landscapes as a process. Um, as being uh, the result of agricultural development and colonization policies which were translated into schemes and that eventually were implemented and produced landscapes. So we're looking at the whole process that produced these landscapes. 
Um, they were produced in quite different political and ideological contexts uh, and were pivotal to nation building and state building processes. Uh, of course, they uh, also aimed at modernizing the countryside uh, and were a testing ground and a shared challenge for the ideas and tools of all kinds of experts. And this is, of course, one aspect that draws our attention. Um, but they have seldom been considered as a transnational research topic. So there's a lot of literature on a fairly good share of our case studies that has been developed uh, and is still ongoing, mostly at the regional and national scale. So one of our big challenges here uh, is to claim that these are not specific experiments and phenomena that are restricted to a national situation, a national context. Um, there have been very few attempts to provide this kind of larger transnational overview, uh, which are in some sense inspirational to our project, uh, but perhaps too narrow to our view. Uh, so this is one of them comparing uh, the policies implemented uh, in uh, Roosevelt's America under the United States, under the New Deal, um, under uh, fascist Italy in the interwar period, and uh, under the uh, Nazi regime in Germany, uh, spotting out a number of common features, which doesn't mean that they're, they may be equated, uh, but it shows that the convergence of mass propaganda, a charismatic figure, gigantic public works, and this is where we stand, uh, and the omnipresence of <coughs> populist and paternalist state are common features. Um, other attempts uh, look at the phenomenon at with a geographical framing focused on the Mediterranean, claiming that there would be some kind of Mediterranean specificity you know, of implementing these kind of policies that may provide answers in front of today's challenges. Um, other interesting um, contributions come from the field of uh, rural history, agricultural history, uh, like this recent book, uh, which basically looks at a number of the case studies that we're looking at uh, in fascist and authoritarian states throughout the 20th century, um, <coughs> showing that these modernist landscapes were less of an aberration than an attempt to speed up the modernization of agriculture, which I think makes a lot of sense to us too. Although what we're claiming here is that a, C, D, C, S, I, C, D, C, P, and MRLs, modernist rural landscapes and the schemes and policies that uh, stand behind are not specific to authoritarian states. So, our research question. Uh, well, <clears throat> these policies and schemes had and still have an impact on people's lives as individuals and as communities. Uh, but they are largely ignored by mainstream scholarship and policies in the field. Um, as time passes, buildings and landscapes deteriorate, and the people who lived in them as they developed are dying out. So, modernist rural landscapes become increasingly difficult to understand as unique forms of cultural heritage. Um, there are tangible evidence of recent European history and a largely underestimated share <coughs> of heritage at the European scale. So, let's say our overarching and almost pathological research question is how can we actually <coughs> build upon the case studies we're looking at um, and say, okay, this is a transnational phenomenon. Um, 
This is something that is shared across country among people that are in Europe or at its border, and that may be a support to think about what it means to be European in the countryside. Uh, and this is the sense of this short excerpt from this uh, Mind and Body of Europe declaration that was issued uh, in 2014. Concepts. So basically, we have three humanities driven concepts that are kind of keeping together all the project, and they're embedded in the title Modernist Rural Landscapes. Um, reinventions of Modernist Rural Landscapes. So, modernism is one, reinvention is a second concept, and landscape is a third one. Sorry. <clears throat> Modernism being the <coughs> cultural and artistic expression of core modern values. Uh, values such as speed, efficiency, labor division, uh, the uh, prominence of the city, of industry. Um, that's modernity. Modernism is its, its expression in the built environment, in art, in literature, in movies. Um, we're not really used to think of modernism in the countryside. So looking at this presence of modernism in the countryside kind of gives us a blurred or more nuanced understanding of what the process of modernization was. Um, and in the countryside, what uh, some scholars have termed as high modernism, that is the crucial role of making things visible okay. by mapping, by statistics, uh, had a kind of very important role in our modernist rural landscapes. Uh, and the question that is kind of driving all this uh, perspective uh, on our case study is, can we now reapply this idea of making things legible to understand our uh, case studies and perhaps to deconstruct some of the coercitive and totalizing processes that were embedded in making modernist rural landscapes. Reinvention. Uh, it's pretty much about how modern nation states use imagination and creativity uh, to steer change, fast-paced change, uh, and its contradictions, uh, and to build new communities and identities. Uh, and what we're looking at uh, are the different styles. In each country, the imagination, the creativity, is developed in a different way. Okay. Um, and the question driving us here is how can we look at the future and test this concept of reinvention in the face of current challenges? <clears throat> Finally, landscape. So landscape is, a, we would say in French, a mot valise, a luggage word. A lot of people use it uh, quite inappropriately, putting whatever they want inside of it. Uh, so we're basically looking at landscape from the, as it has been defined by the European uh, Landscape Convention, as being the world as perceived by people. Okay. So it's not the physical support, it's what people represent as a social group about this physical support. Of course, the built environment is important, mm -hmm. but there is this dimension of perception. Uh, and we have used landscape here as being the unifying paradigm, the, the big concept that is putting all things together. Uh, first because uh, uh, talking about landscape means involving a transdisciplinary uh, approach, uh, bridging uh, life sciences, ecology, uh, urban planning, infrastructures, engineering, uh, uh, cultural geography, uh, literature, uh, art history, all these specific, specific disciplinary fields in which each of our team members are experts 
can somehow find their place in this big concept. Um, but also to integrate research policy and practice. So one could look at landscape as we analyze reality, but landscape is also a project. Um, some say it's a means of approaching history with an action-oriented objective. So can landscape help us to explain some of the historical processes that made today's environment, and can it help understand how landscape is used to remember the past and to envisage the future? Our case studies. We've been pretty ambitious. Um, we have case studies in former uh, GDR, Democratic Republic of Germany, um, in Estonia and Latvia, uh, in Palestine under British mandate and today's Israel, uh, in Libya, in Morocco, in Portugal, uh, two valleys in Spain, and two areas in Italy, as well as uh, two valleys in northern Greece. So we're pretty much covering different areas of Europe, um, but also of bordering areas. And if you have a few notions of history, you quite easily see <coughs> that not all of these case studies uh, uh, concern uh, areas that once were under an authoritarian regime. So this is also a way of breaking or trying to have the possibility to break uh, the present literature's uh, perspective on the topic. Work packages. Basically we had five work packages. Well, our work packages are like this very large set of tasks that have to be completed throughout the research. Um, each work package is kind of driven by a question. Okay, so we have one work package which is about documenting policies and schemes. So the question is what was debated, what was planned. Um, second work package is about physical legacies. What was realized and what is still there to be seen. Um, social cultural impacts. What were uh, agricultural development policies, schemes, and modernist rural landscapes, broader impacts. Um, and then the people, memories and the perception um, of uh, agricultural development and colonization policies, schemes, and modernist rural landscapes. How do people see this history and their built environment? Uh, and the values that were embedded, and the objectives that, would, that they were aiming to, and so on. Um, and finally, a quite small, but I guess uh, uh, important work package uh, that is already taking us away from the mm -hmm. era funding scheme and its focus on newness of the past, and possibly preparing us for a bright future of another 20 years of research funding um, changes and challenges in modernist rural landscape. What do we do about it? The objectives. So we have a set of objectives that are related to the potential values for user communities. Um, by looking at modernist rural landscapes as a cultural heritage, which is probably the most obvious way of looking at it, uh, we aim to raise awareness and understanding of local communities' daily environments uh, and help them identify challenges in their environments and perhaps empower them in participating in the evolution of their living environments. Um, by looking at modernist rural landscapes as a transnational shared cultural heritage across Europe and beyond, uh, we aim to question local communities' self-perceived exceptionalism, as if they were the only one that uh, were lucky enough to be settled in a nice farm almost for free by the state. 
Um, and also to sound the availability of people living in, in, in these modern industrial landscapes, to look at what has happened to them as being part of a shared European history. Um, and of course, also kind of, you know, give visibility to potential tourists of these places, which probably are not, you know, on the top of the agenda, uh, when you have to pick up a um, holiday destination. Um, more from our research-oriented perspective, by developing a reflective approach to the research topic, uh, we aim to provide citizens, <coughs> but also decision makers, practitioners in the field, present and future generations of actors in the field, and some of them are here today, uh, with tools to envisage the future development of modern rural landscapes, to think about future sustainable and inclusive rural landscapes, villages and cities, to publicly debate past and current narratives uh, against European narratives, uh, or to discuss these past policies and schemes against what is being implemented at the European level in terms of welfare, rural development, immigration management, um, and so on. And to contribute to different academic fields. And perhaps be strong enough to settle and establish a more permanent network that will last after the end of the project. I'm getting to the end. Uh, work plan and outputs. Very briefly, the project uh, has, by these two years of hard research, time. Uh, and then, obviously, throughout the three years duration of the project, we do a lot of dissemination, uh, mostly in the last year. The project officially started in last September. Um, we have now reached the launch event. Um, we'll have a forthcoming seminar in Porto uh, in uh, May. Uh, and then the next big event would be in Tartu, with a midterm event uh, one year from now. Then again, a seminar in Berlin this time. Supposedly, we'll have a final event in Brussels. And then the project ends sometime in September 2019. So, all along this uh, uh, duration, uh, and throughout these big milestones that we have reached, uh, we plan to produce a number of, out of outputs that are talking to different publics, to different, different audiences, like the broader public, civil society, and local or European stakeholders, um, people uh, in our reference research field, in our more closer and adjacent research field, and our, in our specific research field, and we have a number of deliverables, things we produce that will populate uh, this uh, the research duration and address all of these audiences. So I'm basically done. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful. Keep connected. We'll soon be online and have a lot of very interesting materials uh, uh, to put there. And yes, I think it's time for the question. Thank you.